All right, listen, an essay on truck tolls and then some fun. Is that a deal? That's a deal. Okay. My shirt matches the letters today. We wish you a Merry Christmas. You get it? The whole thing? No bah humbug here. This is our last original show for 2015. Woo! So we've got all sorts of shows that we thought were pretty good, and the ratings are pretty good, so you thought they were pretty good, until the end of the new year. My problem is i got to cut promos for every one of them after this show. And my guest already told me, he agrees with me, that I don't have to do the... It's inside baseball, but Lexi, the perfectionist producer, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, all right, I'm a little agitated tonight. Steve, are you okay? He's all right. Let's do the rundown, and then you're going to meet the director at Trinity Rep. I told you it would be a good show. All right, let's go to the rundown. Why am I yelling at you? I, you didn't do anything. You're sitting on the couch eating something, which you shouldn't be doing. It's not good this late. You shouldn't be doing that. Uh, can we talk about truck tolls? Oh, we better, because i got a whole bunch of stuff on them. And if I don't, Lexi will have a conniption. Uh, the governor just doesn't get it. Here was Tim. This is going to be a follow the bouncing ball thing, OK? Just this past weekend, on Newsmakers, on the issue of whether the governor will cough up the logistics and details and locations of the toll places, the gantries, if you will, that she wants to include in her roadworks program. Tim does everything he can. Watch. In June, there was a hearing, and we put out the list uh, proposed, as you say. And as you know, Tim, we're not asking for vote on gantries. Right? That's going to be a separate, separate public process. All this legislation does is enable tolling and enable a bond. Um, the real question, the real question isn't exactly where the, where, where the gantry is going to go. The real question is, are we going to do something? Well, but that's a real question by the House Speaker. He's asking your office for that list. I don't, you know, the June list you put out is clearly not um, full enough for them. And you have the Trucking Association put in a access to public records act so obviously they're looking for more information which is a f well, look which is a fair request you know initially uh, he said we need more information around the proposal we right. gave that then he said we need more information on the economic impact study we did yet another study we said it creates 6,000 jobs we did that this is a huge proposal you could handpick it to death and constantly ask for information requests. And I will give whatever information at the time of a hearing that I have that's necessary. What I need to know is, are you committed to passing a bill? Are you committed to doing something about the fact that we have the worst bridges in America? Before I've you had give a the proposal. gantry locations? You, by the way, you can't uh, have gantry locations until you have a piece of legislation. Uh, Governor, you can't pass a bill until you give us the locations. Okay? This is not chicken or the egg. This is chicken and then the egg. You have to give us the details on the locations in order for a responsible legislature to pass the bill. Now, she's starting to listen a little, little, little bit. Do you remember uh, last Friday? Because I know you watch every night and don't ever miss a show. Arlene Violet was here to talk about the book that she co-wrote, but at the beginning of the show, we talked some issues. And I asked her about her thought process on how Gina Raimondo is driving this roadworks truck toll thing. And she said the following. Well, the great state, again, you know, there are many, many problems. You know, I know uh, the governor's, you know, trying her best, but, you know, she's got to be much more transparent. Uh, I want to credit you with the idea uh, that she uh, had an exit strategy when that unfound $1.1 billion came into the state that Jack Reed found. She could have retired gracefully saying, we've got the money now. I don't have to put uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of pay interest burden on you. What are we, like fourth or something, mm -hmm. or seventh in the country in terms of bonded indebtedness uh, but she didn't take it and I, I don't know who's advising her Dan but you know she's not going the right way particularly on transparency issues okay Arlene was right on the money there so what she was talking about was Jack Reed our senior senator came back with a boatload of federal money which buoys the ability to be able to fix roads and bridges and could lessen the, the need if there wasn't a whole political fix in to get this 500 million dollar 
program, $1.1 billion in total interest cost over 30 years, shoved down our throats. Labor has a lot to do with this in campaign promises and the like. But she's beginning to listen a little. Here was the headline, giving in is Gina in this particular scene. Romando to open negotiation on what? She wants to make good to the Speaker and the Senate President, who's been dragged along in this whole thing, by laying out the gantry location. She's not ready to give in on the idea of truck tolls, because that's her big bender, and she still wants to borrow a boatload of money. But to get it all done, she's willing to let us in on the secret as to where these gantries are going to be, as evidenced by a letter that a spokesperson for the governor sent to Ted Nisi earlier today, trying to explain that. Um, and she refers to the federal money that has come in, which adjusts her, I don't know, stress level on the whole thing. So follow, Arlene said, gee, I can't believe she missed that opportunity, because I've been opining that way too, when the new money came in. Now she's citing the new money as a reason for her to say, okay, you can see the gantries. Those two things don't match up, but she's got in her head that she has to start giving in a little, so she's giving in on that. So Nick Mattiello forced the issue, our House Speaker. Fine. He is stuck, though, on the idea of truck tolls himself, and I'm not sure if it's because it's purposeful or whether he's making some deals, keeping the truck tolls in there while he's trying to do a couple of end runs around. Headline for the speaker, he's correct, borrowing is too expensive, yet when it comes to the truck tolls specifically, he told Gene on the WPR Morning News this morning that we have to have them. How are we going to fix all of our bridges and highways that need attention in Rhode Island by just borrowing about half a billion? Won't there be cost overruns? And that's the concern. Once you get the gantries up, you're going to go to just a regular driver in a car. Now, and if I may please address that, go ahead. Gene, because that, that, that's an important issue for the public. I have the exact opposite viewpoint. Yes, you might end up with cost overruns. You always do on big projects. But let's, let's look at it from a different perspective. Our bridges and overpasses are deteriorating deteriorating on a daily basis. Right now, I'm, I'm very confident, as is the governor and the Senate president, that we can address the issue in the fashion that we're trying to address it. There, there's, there are rumors that once they put up the gantry, they're, of course, going to move on to cars. Yeah. Not as long as I'm speaker. It's not happening. But I will tell you, beyond that, at a time that I can't necessarily predict, I can tell you one thing. If we don't address our infrastructure today, some future governor, some future speaker, some future Senate president is going to have to tow trucks, cars, bicycles, and tricycles because we're going to have an emergency yeah. situation on our hands. If we get our infrastructure under control today, yeah. we'll never have to tow cars. Just 30 so the, the truck tolls prevent the need to have to do cars in the future, not encourages it. What a load of hooey that is. You, you got to be kidding me. First of all, as long as I'm the speaker, hey, you know what? There's 2,000 voters in your tiny little district, Nick, that could send you packing any minute now. I know you think you're King Tut, but you know what? You're Funky Tut. You're, you, it's, it's a fluid situation every two years. So somebody else comes in there and says, okay, let's see if we can do the math here. We're not getting the money we need to fund this outside revenue source from the tolls because we're not getting enough toll revenue. But we got these babies up at 40 to $60 million worth of infrastructure. Hmm, I wonder where we can get that money. Now, if you're wondering, why would we fall short on this? Listen to the warning from the Truckers Association and Chris Maxwell, who runs the Truckers Association, who said this on our show only last week about the truckers and what they're going to do if the gantries go up. The notion that a state that is this dysfunctional, that has put this infrastructure in the position that it's in, that has scapegoated an industry, um, the, the, the fact, the notion that's happening, uh, nationwide they're looking at this and they're, they're going to make it fail. That's, that's the bottom line. And then that, that loss of revenue from the through truckers who are... Who are Meaning who, they'll go up 395 to the pike. They'll go up 395 to the Mass Pike. Pike's 11 bucks to get to where they would be going in the Correct. Northeast Corridor. Correct. Anyway. and 50 cents versus 30 dollars, and and the fact now that you're hitting two of the top 100 bottlenecks in the Northeast in the country, Route 95, 195, and 95, 128. Another fact that will support diversion. 
All right, listen, you guys have got to get involved in this over the course of the holidays. Take your winter break, take your holiday break, and come back roaring, because this is going to be first up in the new year in the General Assembly. If they don't make the nut with the trucks that don't want to pay the tolls and they avoid them and they miss their calculations, they raise the rates on the truckers, which is like flushing the toilet because it's completely a, a bad cycle. You raise the rates, less truckers pay them because they avoid the state even more. And then they come for us, the great unwashed, as we pay tolls to go down 146? Are you kidding me? The artistic director at Trinity Rep wants to opine on this. He told me, he called me, he said, can I talk about the truck tolls? Um, let's uh, just preview some of what's going on. I have no way to make this transition from that speech to this terrific guest. You are now forced <laughs> I to offer to an opinion. I have nothing to say about trucks. I really don't. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm sorry. Out. But Dan, I love everything that you're saying. It's a, uh, so, you know, I'm learning a lot. Merry Christmas. To you as well. Good to see Merry you. Merry Christmas. Trinity Rep is the coolest place ever. It is. I think it is. And you got so much going on. Yeah. Christmas Carol is running through what? December, December 31st? December 31st. We're, go we're go to our websites like, if you want to see showtimes because we've got all that information yeah. at foxprovidence.com. It's, uh, it's uh, running two times every day right now. I mean, we're Christmas 24-7. we go to Fox Providence. Well, if then they can, and they'll, but they'll, they'll also find that we're there twice a day. So <laughs> we got Scrooge on a, on a loop right now. Uh. <laughs> Put that in the promo. <laughs> Come to Trinity yeah. Rep for a Scrooge on a loop. It's Scrooge loop. on a loop. That, you got to be careful with yeah. that one. And, so. and Fizzy Fezzy Wig Punch. <laughs> but anyway. You've got a lot. There's a lot going on. Yeah. Give, me, give me the highlight of 2015, and then we'll talk more about everything that's going on at Trinity Rep. Golly. You know, there's a lot. There's so much that, that hit a high in 2015. You know, we have... Maybe not a lot of your viewers remember this. Trinity Rep has the last long-standing resident acting company in America, right? We are, we've been around for 50 years. We have folks who have been with us for 40 plus years. Um, That's incredible. It is, it is. We're the last of our kind in America and it's right here in Rhode Island. Um, and so uh, the highlights from this year really had to do with the kind of work that our company's been doing, the kind of attention that they're getting nationally. We world premiered a musical in June. Uh, uh, it was called Melancholy Play, a chamber musical. Funny, smart, there's interest in it in New York. And you know, that's all built around our resident actors who are here, who make Providence, Rhode Island their home. Uh, uh, well, Rhode Island their home. They're from all sure. around. Um, and so it's stuff like that that, that happens on a regular so basis. So you're not just borrowing great work and, no. and, and re artistically creating it at Trinity Rep. You're creating art yeah, there. We, we originate a lot of stuff. Uh, at least one world premiere work every year. We do a lot of new plays. We look at classic plays but in a new way. So there's a, a, a piece going on right now called The Heidi Chronicles. Hilarious. Um, you know, I, I think one of the reviews was said something like, rethinking a feminist classic. Um, and it's very funny. It's, it's very uh, smart. And people, audiences have just been going crazy for it. And it's a play that's been around for a long time, mm. but you come to Trinity and it's new. All right. Some, uh, some important social conversation has occurred yeah. at Trinity Rep as well. We'll talk about that when we come back and a whole lot more. Stay with us. Now, I know, listen, Christmas Carol is going on and all that kind of stuff, and we'll talk more about the, the fun and creative stuff, but I was... I, I was moved by the fact that Trinity Rep, I missed this, I had a commitment, I couldn't get yeah. to the show, but we have been talking, uh, Mr. Artistic Director at Trinity Rep, for a while here about some really important issues. The Black Lives Matter thing has coughed up one national conversation. We have two big national conversations going on right That's now. That's right. What to do with Muslims since Donald Trump opened his mouth. Yep. yep. And and the Black Lives Matter and black major movement in the city of Providence. And there, there are thoughtful people on all sides of the issue. Yes. But attention was drawn to what you did at Trinity Rep regarding this. Why and who and what happened and how do you think it went? So, okay, what happened is that we were approached in June of last year by a national organization that's, um, that's being driven by a theater in Oregon, Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And they said, look, do you have any artists that you'd like to send to Ferguson, Missouri, to St. Louis, Missouri? to write one-minute plays that address what's going on in those communities. It is not, uh, uh, it was never intended to take sides in the issue. It was intended to illuminate the way that the theater does, to create a space for questions. 
So Joe Wilson Jr., who uh, is in our acting company, who was in the picture that you just showed there, Joe um, went to Ferguson. He spent a week there. He met with police officers. He met with kids in the high school where the, you know, um, the, the kid who got shot was, was a student. He met with teachers. He met with community leaders. There were artists from around the country, about 35 artists, and they put together 60 plays that you can do in nine minute, uh, 90 minutes, okay? Uh, 68 plays that you can do in 98 minutes, 90 minutes. What happened is that those plays were presented in St. Louis in front of an audience of about 400 people. And then they're supposed to be presented again in October of 2016. Well, we sort of misunderstood and by mistake presented them this October, <laughs> two days after Joey got back from St. Louis. We just put them on. We invited community <coughs> members to come in. Uh, uh, literally 90 actors from all around the community, college students, you know, folks who are professional, folks who are, are amateur, came and they performed these plays. There were over 300 people in the audience. We had a live band. We had food trucks. It turned into this really joyous event. And what's interesting, Dan, is that, that the, the, the Providence Journal pitched it in such a way that people thought that it was pro or con around the issue, it couldn't have been a more joyful and loving celebratory event. Well, it's interesting. Ricardo Pitts Wiley, who I'm sure you're familiar with, Absolutely. was, was, was telling us part. about it uh, pre and post. He's been on the show a couple of times, and you know he is absolutely co committed to the idea. Uh, he's at the uh, uh, Mixed Magic, Mixed Magic yep. Theater in Pawtucket, by the yep. way. But his, uh, his, his suggestion is that the arts have got to stop playing a secondary role in these big social conversations. Exactly. That it's actually, it's actually the place where tension is properly processed. Correct. And that this ends up being more of, hmm, this. And th so this is what happened. We, That's my know, interpretation. I anyway. totally uh, think you've got it exactly right. What happened is we had people who, who wrote us nasty letters saying, you know, how you're taking sides in this issue. And I, I said to each and every one of them, please come to this event and you'll know that that's not the case at all. Because the theater is a space for people to deliberate. And you know this, you're, but you're involved in, in public discourse. Public discourse in this country is not deliberative. <laughs> it's provocative. But it is rarely deliberative. We are a deliberative space. And I agree with Ricardo 100%. Our job is to reclaim being that deliberative space for Rhode Island, for um, you know, American democracy. Um, and that's why we're doing things like the Heidi Chronicles right now, which is focusing on feminism. The show that we've got coming up uh, in January, phenomenal show, a young writer named Sharice <coughs> Castro-Smith. She's a Latina writer. Um, who's making it big in LA right now. Anyway, it's called The Hunchback of Seville. It's this hilarious comedy. I tell people it's as if the writing staff for The Daily Show was writing about the history of the colonization of America and um, Queen Isabella of Spain. Funny. Funny, smart, uh, bawdy, weird, and also about who owns history, you know, which is Everything has to be about that conversation. We're doing uh, To Kill a Mockingbird in the spring because we want to be doing plays that interrogate, you know, uh, American ideals of justice um, and also give people a good evening in the theater. You know, we try to do it all. You can do both. You absolutely and can. And I think, I think when people walk away from presentations that make you think certainly about current events and challenges, it gives it gives a wholly different perspective. So I'm glad you're embracing that kind of res have, always have, but I'm glad that you're kind of almost doubling down on some doubling of that responsibility. Down. And I see. I think that's why Christmas Carol is so popular every year because that's actually a very political story, mm -hmm. and we tell it in a way that's provocative. You know, that that sort of asks people to think about <laughs> how they interact with the world and with other people, and that's why ours continues to be reinvented every year and it continues to be one of those things that Rhode Islanders go to every year. Yet the arts in this state in many ways have to fight for their territory even though they're the biggest source of pride in the state, which <laughs> is interesting. We'll talk to Kurt about that when we come back. Stay with us. Kurt recently celebrated 10 years at Trinity Rep. You've seen a lot in 10 years, I am quite certain. 
uh, yeah. not just in what you've been able to produce there. I mean, Trinity Rep is just a tremendous source of pride. I mean, it's such an easy visit. It's uh, the the plays are right there. You know, I'm a big basketball fan. It's it's the equivalent of a of an arena that goes right to the floor. Exactly. It just it just it just is such a perfect, intimate, yeah. yet showy setting. Yeah. I mean, you feel like you're at a show, but you yeah. feel like you can touch the actors, and right. you actually could if you well, want, but please and, don't. And that's a, no, no, you can touch them. <laughs> well, depending on the show, <laughs> right? This is the thing that that you know, it's the it's actually one of the founding aesthetics of our theater is that it goes out into the audience, right? Adrian Hall, Eugene Lee, guys that that you know rethought what American theater was were right here in Providence, Rhode Island, and and they wanted to break the barrier between audience and actor. Talk to me about uh, and this is a conversation. We've come back and talked about this at length because I think this yes. is with others from from the field. We in every poll and every questionnaire and every reference to what makes Rhode Island so great, we'll put art and our theater component at the highest level, yeah. yet there's a constant battle yeah. for economic solvency. Yep. Yeah. Give me two minutes on that. I, well, I, I'm, I think it goes further than just the arts. I think um, there, you know, you just saw the statistics on the culture of philanthropy here in Rhode Island, and we're all nonprofits, uh, particularly in the arts, but there are a lot of nonprofits. In fact, I think the the second highest number of nonprofits in our state of any state, um, and we're uh, 47th in terms of our philanthropic giving. I mean, there's a there's a there's a missing culture of philanthropy here that was here many years ago. Um, so I'd I'd love to talk at length about that with you, mm. um, and I think that has to do very much with civic leadership. Um, you know love him or hate him, we had a mayor here a couple of decades ago who talk, who could talk about the arts, uh, who, who always put the arts first in all of his conversations. Now, uh, our current mayor in Providence is doing the same thing, and that's a good thing. Um, and it makes a change in terms of how people think about us. Um, they don't think of us as an add-on. Uh, they, they, they start to request that we step up and do the thing that you're asking us to but do. But the thing is, is that on an educational level, this yeah. will be our last thought, and then we'll expand when we come back in January. I hope you will. I will. Um, you know, we've stripped music and the arts yep. from our educational curriculums, and, and what we miss, I think, is that we've got such learning centers with Trinity Reps and all that we have to offer that if we think about this, it's not only, hey, isn't that nice for a Saturday night out? Yeah. It's a curriculum growth opportunity for these kids all and to, to change the culture of the state again. Dan, you know we're in 100% of Providence Public Schools. We're in 60% of the schools in southern New England. We have programs that affect about 20 to 30,000 kids a year. We teach at the theater, we teach in the schools. We have kit programs for kids and on the autism And you're going to need a couple spectrum. of tax dollars to support it yeah. every once in yeah. a while. That's, yeah. the, that's the tease for January when we come back. Congratulations Thank on you. 10 years. And uh, Thanks. You know, Trinity Rep, folks. By the way, twice a day until the end, go to foxprovidence.com for the schedules on the show. We'll be right back for the last word. Just a note here, this is our last broadcast for 2015, original broadcast. We will have some replays of shows throughout uh, the holiday season up until the time we start again on January 4th. Thank you so much for the viewership and passing the word about Dan York's State of Mind. Our growth this year has been terrific, and it's all because you've decided to watch. I'm honored. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas.